This time we zoom in, inexpertly, on a box with metal clamps within. But not quite yet. The actual purpose is to stop people falling off Alan the Lifeboat's narrow bow platform at sea, even those we'd rather did. So back to the clamps. I've plucked out this fine pair of heavy duty vertical mounting clamps first. They are well galvanised, but to fit Alan's aesthetic, we're going back to black with a primer laced with lots of zinc. I stuff tissue into the holes to avoid gooing up the threads with paint. This matte finish isn't the final look, but will do for now. This is where they will go. One each side of the boat, as low as possible, and round to the side far enough that I hope they will provide stability, but not get in the way of mooring and so on. I'm marking the first hole with a full size drill bit first, then having learned lessons from the past, drilled the first hole, placed the bolt through, and then only marked and drilled the others then. I found that marking and then drilling all the holes first tends to lead to a calamity of misalignment. Holes made in glass fibre, done. Now for gunge. My favourite boss stick for something serious like this, and I'm careful to make sure there's a good seal around the edge, the holes, but also around the top of the bolt thread so water can't creep through. We have success on the outside, but that leaves the inside. In a manner similar to that you've seen me employ before, I've removed a small patch of insulation and plonked on those extra thick washers to get a really wide, strong clamping force. Very happy with that, and then I patched it up. Once again, you'd never know that I'd been in there. Those who were fans of my jammed spanner solo bolt tightening technique in the transom bracket installation episode will be familiar with this sight. Without the use of an old wintertime clip that sat in the to use folder for months, it's time to unsheath some seriously long lengths of new purchases. And magically summer again, here's the length of railing tube that should probably be shortened somewhat from its 6 meters. People will know I now have a new angle grinder, but perhaps some somber footage of the old blue grinder by way of a tribute. The aluminium needs to be prepped for use, and that generally means an etch primer both inside and out, and then a couple of good coats of marine top gloat gloss paint. Wonderful, and now to see how they look. The brackets have closed bottoms, so it's not merely down to a grub screw or two to stop them popping out down and into the sea where most needed, and I've kept them overly long to be cut down a little bit later, as I expertly act out here with precise measurements. I chopped them down to size with the spinny thing, and then swapped out the cutting disc for the flap wheel and rounded off the sharp ends. They're pretty much done, so I can put them in the brackets and tightly lock in the grub screws. The softer rail metal actually works better than if I'd used hard stainless steel tube, as the screws wouldn't have been able to really grip. More brackets, more tissue paper stuffing, and 360 degree spray priming later, we have a T bracket neatly on top of each of the vertical supports. Even without any braces, they are admirably stout and non-wiggly. If I'd merely placed a crossbar from here at the top to the other top, there'd be barely any room to lean forward, so I'd need an extension, or extensions. Two shorter sections of tube will do the job, and they fit into place in exactly the manner you'd predict. On the ends of those, I now need to do a little more customization. These flat plate brackets are a good start, but not quite right. I don't need both ends, as one would end up sticking out. Naturally, I'm going to chop them off. A few grinder cuts, and one misjudged cut we will never speak of again, and the rough shape is done, to be cleaned up with the ever-present flap wheel. Very smart, but not nearly as smart as they looked once they both went through the spotlessly clean painting shack, and remembering to get plenty inside, as sea or rainwater pooling inside is probably worse than direct water splashes from the front. They fitted on, and we're now down to the two final, but rather key, components of these safety railings. So, polyester fabric. A special sort of ultra-fine weave called dialin. It's lesser known but quite useful in the composite laminating world. Much lighter than glass fibre, it's extremely impact and fatigue resistant, but is not as stiff. But stiffness in a panel or other composite parts can be achieved using depth, rather in the same way that tubes and box sections resist bending forces. I'll add some carbon fibre to the outer layers, but the front railing is to be chiefly a dialin composite. All the strips can be arranged and then brushed with laminating resin, but once I was happy that it was properly wetted out, yet not drowning in excess epoxy, more needed to be done to the currently flat bar. I raised up both ends whilst the resin was still entirely uncured, and then compressed the full length with plenty of heavy objects. So we'll see how that turns out. It's the slow cure resin hardener. It takes a full day for the chemical reaction to complete, but you do end up with slightly better performance in return. 
I've actually started using the much thinner infusion epoxy resin for some of these flat brush layups as it wets out the fabrics more quickly and avoids any ill-advised tampering of normal resins by adding thinners. What a perfect opportunity for me to, for a few moments of the curing process, enjoy the increasingly balmy early summer days. I inspected the new mast and noticed something strange. This. And this. And this. And this. How odd. I wonder how they all got there. I contemplated the wisdom of these four special channel members over a bowl of fresh egg tortellini, the chosen fast food of the gods. Naturally, my thoughts also extended to my branded Allen baseball cap, which I urge you to join me in owning. And the front bar was complete. I added some lightweight box section as there was still a little bit more flex than I wanted, and then time to do a wrap. I've used heat shrink wrap on grab handles to good effect previously, so I got hold of some extra wide stuff in tests that a while back I noticed could be tricky to shrink uniformly and I couldn't get the whole length around all the corners without getting jammed, so it has to be done in sections. Which is okay. Or is it? Heat shrinking can be quite satisfying, but this heavy duty stuff with glue lining is a brute to get back off if you mess up. Complete, and it's still pretty lightweight, and it does span the full gap. I would have had to have had a moment if somehow it was too short. But it wasn't, so that's okay. It needed some holes in it if the bar was going to stay up, so I did that, strangely enough with a drill, and then I did a final check that the bolts, that I've recently become aware are actually set screws, but will continue to call bolts, pass through with a slight resistance. The crossbar still spans the gap, and as I did the whole washer and nut thing, we had a success. But, of course, if you fell against the railing in its current state, you'd not break it, but it would likely deflect more than you'd want. I considered more solid railing reaching back to Allen's shell, but the angles would be really complex in both planes, so I've gone rogue. You can see I've still got to finish the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the fairing around the base of the uh, the H cow, but um, I hope you can also notice I've got some very very smart rubber caps there to avoid giraffe when I don't want any. When I was ordering the masts wire ropes from the excellent custom guys at GS Products, I added two more to the order. They need robust anchors, so I casually drilled some holes in Alan's upper shell. At first, I used the diameter drill that matched the size of the holes in the eye plate but then with some trepidation, enlarged them both to about 10 millimeters. Why, you may ask? Well, after months of people shouting at me in the comments across a number of episodes, I do now have a rivet nut setting tool. A novel concept to me, I had to get familiar with these new sorts of rivets, new to me at least, and that included some dry runs to test and making sure I was compressing them the right way round. The enlarged 10mm holes in the fiberglass were of course because these set nuts are wider than the bolt diameter that would in due course run through the threaded bore, and I opted not to countersink into the fiberglass. I was considering countersinking it, but actually I quite like the fact there's a little lip of the metal which will sit on just on top of the uh, gel coat here. I think that with more sealant will give me a really nice seal, so I'm actually going to leave it as it is. Right, riv nutting commences. I'm still a beginner and it's harder than normal pot riveting as you need to make sure all the angles are perpendicular and there's no satisfying snap on completion. You seem to need to judge when there's enough expansion behind the glass shell, too much and perhaps I could damage the shell. Back out with some more sealant, just basic polyurethane this time, and the same thought process, some to squidge under the metal once bolted down, some around the holes and some inside the holes, because why not indeed, Finally, some more sealant under the heads of the bolts to complete the seal. So, that's one done, and it was important to position these carefully so the wire ropes can reach. I set the turnbuckle tension at a halfway along its length so I didn't end up with a disaster, too long or too short. And I did the starboard side one too. Even I'm not obtuse enough to forego this symmetry. I did double check the lengths, and it's then time for the finishing touches. The jaws of the wire ropes won't fit around the thick steel of the tube clamps, so once again a moment for Grinder Mark II to shine. I flattened the protrusion, for which it forgave me, checked it now fitted, and then did the paint thing one last time. I connected the wire ropes, tensioned them, surveyed my work, found out that the whole structure was pretty damn strong, confirmed that it matched Alan's industrial aesthetic and not some dainty, curvaceous yacht railings, and then I surveyed the scene from below. I don't like it. I really don't like it. The space it gives people on the bow is fine, but for the size and weight, the crossbar frankly isn't much better than if I'd used the length of tube, whether or not I paid to have it professionally curved to follow this sort of shape. 
I didn't originally envisage these extenders, so the customised shape that drove the project is rather redundant. But it's there now. I simply don't have the time to redo it before launch, and I'm still rather emotionally invested in the composite crossbeam. Right. Bye.